everyone and welcome back to lecture. Today we're going to be turning our attention to chapter 6 and we're going to be focusing primarily on diversion within this chapter. In the last lecture we looked at pre-child supervision and what life is like in jail. Now we're going to take a look at official and unofficial efforts to keep people out of jail and out of the formalized criminal justice system altogether. Diversion serves many purposes but mainly it serves as an opportunity for first-time offenders to have a second chance and to not be wrapped up in the system, which can lead to further damage. Let's go ahead and get started looking at this topic. Before we can get too far into looking at diversion as an action, we first need to look at diversion from a definitional perspective. Diversion is basically taking folks out of the CJ system and sending them somewhere else. It gives them another chance to not mess up and to stay out of formal sanctioning. Remember when we talked about the specialty courts. If the defendant violates the conditions that the court sets forth, then they would serve the remainder of their deferred sentence or they could sent, be sent back to the traditional court system. For diversion, there is no deferred sentence. Instead, the defendant is sent to a service provider who works with the individual to combat whatever problem is happening. If, then, the defendant violates the terms of their diversion program, the courts can decide to go forward with the charges that were against the defendant to begin with. So when does diversion occur then? Diversion can happen at any point after police contact is made. That could be after the booking or, at, or after the arrest rather or after the booking, but it has to take place before a sentence is given to the defendant. So the police needs to have an encounter with the individual that is later diverted. That normally occurs when a crime happens. The police can then choose not to arrest the individual and transfer them to a treatment provider. Or the police can arrest the individual and the DA can later make the call to divert the defendant because he or she meets the qualifications to do so. But diversion has to take place before the actual conviction occurs. Once the conviction occurs, then the individual is no longer eligible for diversion. So I pose this question to you. As we go through lecture, I want you to be thinking about who is a good candidate for diversionary programs. By the end of the lecture today, you should be able to answer this question. So why do we want to divert individuals anyway? Programs that divert first time, low level, or generally just non-serious offenders can actually save the justice system tremendous costs that are related to prosecution and defense attorneys and judicial services, court personnel, filing fees, and even later detention sentences. Diversion and deferred sentencing uh, actually promote a sense of justice by addressing social and medical and personal factors that are associated with crime and with recidivism. The first goal of diversionary programs are at all costs to avoid negative labeling. If I convict you on a drug offense or of DUI, DWI, then what I end up doing is putting the official label of offender or of criminal on you. By doing this, I could carry that, lab that label around with me for the rest of my life for one potential one-time mistake. Secondly, we want to try and reduce unnecessary social control. This, th this means that for many of these individuals, because they are first-time offenders, they don't necessarily need a high level of punishment for that behavior to be corrected. DUI offenders are not necessarily trying to harm anyone else, even though the action is inherently wrong, and they may have believed that they were fine to drive. Their blood alcohol content wasn't that high, and it was their first offense, but they were scared enough by the police contact that for that contact to be an effective control mechanism. Prison might be an excessive punishment for someone who isn't likely to do this behavior a second time. Third, like most goals of the correctional system endeavors, we are trying to reduce recidivism. The court and the criminal justice system do not want these individuals to become regular faces. Instead, they don't ever want to see them again. By not harshly punishing people for their first offense, you can see a high level of success for those who go through diversionary programs compared to those who don't. If they are successfully diverted and are provided the necessary help and support they need, then you won't see a recidivistic offender developed, and that saves us money. 
And that's the fourth goal, is to reduce our costs. Diversion programs are a lot cheaper than having to process the individual through the court system and to later incarcerate them because you found them guilty. These folks are supervised in the community, which we know is generally cheaper than supervision in a facility. Plus, if you are decreasing recidivism levels for those who are going through the programs, then you won't see them again down the line. This saves us money as well. Finally, there is the provision of service and treatment. If there is a problem occurring, meaning that there's a dependence or abuse issue, then getting them the help they need for the illness and addiction will also help with all of these other goals that we're trying to promote. With most crimes that are drug related or associated with mental health issues, the crime is a side effect of the bigger issue. Getting people the help that they need does not make for a weak criminal justice system. Instead, it shows that we know how to help people and how to make good use of our resources. If we are already so overrun by people who are just receiving long prison sentences, then doesn't it make sense to try and not add to the ongoing problem? There are a few different avenues to diversion that can occur in order for an individual to be transferred out of the criminal justice system. First, there is police diversion. This can be a very informal process in which the police officer uses their discretion wisely. Police discretion, or police diversion rather, is all about discretion. If the officer chooses to divert, then they can just refer the individual to the treatment or diversion center that is most applicable to the crime. Remember that diversion can take place upon first contact with the officer. I might not even arrest you, but instead would just divert you to the program. This would be a form of deferred prosecution. There are no formal charges that are filed with the prosecutor's office contingent on the arrestee's successful completion of the diversion program. Think about juvenile diversion to something like the Boys and Girls Club. If the juvenile is acting out because they're unoccupied after school, this leads them to commit delinquent acts. So you have to fill that vacant time up. If they're too busy and they have no free time, then they won't commit delinquent acts. For those of you who have already taken criminology, this is a perfect example of Travis Hershey's social control theory in action. Because of the possibility of expungement, deferred sentences offer one of the best incentives to reform. Getting your record expunged is a huge deal and it's often very difficult to get done once you have been convicted. This basically gives you a clean slate and no conviction is going to show up on your criminal record. It is though the offense never even happened. Your records would be sealed. More often this happens for juvenile offenders. Once you become an adult, your juvenile record becomes sealed. But this can become a very difficult process. It's so difficult that some individuals who are wrongfully convicted can't even get an expungement. Can you imagine that? You were wrongfully convicted and now you, have, you still have a record for something you didn't even do and the courts say you didn't do? Now you have to go and petition the governor's office to try and get your record expunged. It's tough. Just like we discussed that there are certain conditions that pretrial defendants have to abide by while they're out on bond, there are also certain conditions that diversion defendants have to abide by or their diversion can be revoked. If the defendant violates the terms of his or her diversion program, then there are two options for the court and the treatment providers. The defendant may be given another chance and the conditions of the diversion will continue. Or, secondly, the deferred sentence is revoked and the individual is put on probation. Obviously, the best outcome for the defendant is to receive a second chance and to not have his diversion revoked, but that's not always the case. So now that we know a bit about what diversion is, we have to address whether or not it's a common process. The answer to this is no. Diversion is a very rare occurrence and is less likely when we're discussing larger felonies or more violent felonies. The circumstances to receive diversion for something like a murder case would have to be absolutely extreme. Uh, perhaps it was maybe a offense that was committed in self-defense or something of that nature, but it's very rare that the circumstances would be strong enough to even have diversion be considered. They simply wouldn't press charges if everything fell in the direction of self-defense. 
So if felony offenders are not very likely to receive diversion, then who is? If you are an adult, your best shot at diversion is if you commit a non-trafficking drug offense. We are really talking about possession charges here for personal use amounts of the specific drug. This is helping people get clean rather than punishing the illness. If you are caught for possession with intent to distribute, then it is not very likely that you will receive diversion. If you are selling or distributing, your chances also decrease. However, we're also talking about a first-time offender who is charged with a non-trafficking drug offense. If the person doesn't successfully complete the program, or does complete the program and then is later rearrested for a similar charge, then diversion would not be recommended a second time. Diversion often occurs, well, more often occurs rather for juveniles than, adult, than adults. A lot of research suggests that instead of punishing juveniles, we should simply keep them occupied and provide them with a support network that they might otherwise be lacking. Many kids who are committing non-serious offenses are doing them as a way to act out or are committed in reaction to situations that are happening in their homes. So this group of offenders has the best overall chance of receiving diversion. Finally, I just want to spend a quick minute discussing federal pretrial diversion. Everything that we have discussed so far focuses more on county or state level diversion programs. When we talk about federal diversion, we're focusing on a specific group of offenders. I have listed a set of criteria on the screen that is going to show you just how difficult it is to even be eligible for federal diversion. Like other diversion programs, federal diversion is completely voluntary. I don't know why anyone would not want to complete the diversion program if they were eligible, but it is voluntary. But before diversion can even be offered to the defendant, the defendant has to be eligible. That means that the defendant's prior record cannot be felony based. Two or more felony convictions, whether they are violent or nonviolent in nature, make the defendant ineligible. If the individual is an addict, he or she is also ineligible. This one is rather a difficult stipulation as we know that the best chances an individual has for receiving diversion are based on drug-related offenses. So you are then knocked out of the running for that. The next two conditions get rather specific and would really only apply to a certain set of federal defendants. But if you were a current or former public official accused of violating a public trust or you are accused of an offense that is related to national security or foreign affairs, otherwise known pretty much as terrorism, then you are ineligible. Finally, you would be ineligible for federal diversion if you have been charged with a crime that could be transferred to the state courts for prosecution. This is also a tricky one since there are state and federal versions of many crimes that are out there. For instance, let's take drug offenses. They can be prosecuted at the state and federal level, but the feds only take it if there's an interstate issue at play. The same goes for crimes like child pornography. If the child porn is electronic in nature and is a large enough collection, then that would be a federal case. However, both of these can be prosecuted at the state level, so these individuals would be ineligible for, for federal diversion as well. As you can tell by this pretty comprehensive list, Federal diversion is a mighty difficult feat to achieve. Today's lecture focused on the diversion programs that are available to spe specific defendants. The purpose of diversion is to keep first-time offenders out of the formalized criminal justice system and to prevent these individuals from becoming revolving door offenders. This was something that we discussed briefly in the last lecture focusing on pretrial supervision and jails. Diversion is often effective at keeping juveniles occupied and away from delinquent behavior. And it can provide an opportunity for substance users to get clean and to get help. Although this can be a helpful type of program, it's not very common for defendants to be eligible and for them to receive diversion. In the next lecture, we're going to be taking an in-depth look at probation sentences and what it is like for probationers to be on active supervision. So please meet me back here next time when we take a look at Chapter 8.